when you find those, you rejoice and have a party and call your friends in and, and have a great time. Now, we know that the, we're, all of those were based, up, all those uh, results were based upon bulk composition. Now, we know that it isn't the bulk composition that's the issue, it's the surface composition. And indeed, it's certain places on the surface that, that are important. But we need to get something, get some knowledge a bit closer to the surface composition. And one way of doing that is to measure the open circuit voltage. Now, the open circuit voltage is the voltage between the cathode and a reference electrode. And it is a voltage that is proportional to the Gibbs energy uh, of the hydrogen within the surface of the cathode. So it is a quantity that's not directly uh, related, well, it's not, not the surface composition, but it's a quantity that's related to the surface composition. And therefore, its behavior, its, its pattern of behavior, gives you some feel for what's going on. Well, this is the open circuit voltage against the average composition during loading of various materials. And you can see that it rises and during the alpha phase. It's constant during the two phase, because after all, the phases have a constant composition. And then it rises again within the beta phase. Uh, if you apply a higher current, then it deviates from this ideal behavior because there are gradients between the inside of the material, that is the average composition we can measure, and the surface. But in any case, you can see that it reflects on what you'd expect there on the surface from a thermodynamic point of view. This also is, if you, if you deload, you get uh, uh, the reverse of this most of the time. Occasionally, however, you get a different re result when you deload. You get this result. Now, this is rather interesting. This sample had been making excess energy. Its open circuit voltage is very high, and that is characteristic of any sample that's going to make excess energy. You, you're going to end up with a very high uh, excess, a very high open circuit voltage. If it doesn't get high, forget it. You know, don't waste your time on it. But this one started very, very high. And as it deloaded, it dropped down. And then it was a, there was an arrest. And then it continued on down. These values are typical of the beta phase. This value is typical of not typical of the beta phase. And I would argue that it represents the characteristics of this new phase that's on the surface. And it's only by virtue of its formation that you're going to have the environment in which cold fusion can occur. <coughs> well, another way of getting at the uh, surface composition is to use thin films. <coughs> Here I electroplated uh, palladium, uh, in this case films only two microns thick, onto platinum. And it turns out that's a very good way of creating the environment to uh, produce cold fusion. These samples are active more often than our solid materials. But the interesting thing is that you can measure the composition of this surface, that is the average composition of this thin film, and you get values that go up to 1.5. Th this is the average composition of bulk material. And this is the characteristic of this thin film material. In other words, this, this material has a composition of 1.5, I would argue, because less of its thickness is bulk, or, or material that's in below the composition of this super-saturated surface. And therefore, the average is higher. It does mean, however, that the, the true surface, the surface where the action is occurring, has a composition even higher than this. And indeed, this one was not nuclear active. And so to become nuclear active, it's going to have to go even higher than that. I'm proposing that the composition of the true active regions is at least 2.0. And that creates a whole new a possibility for a whole new structure. That being the case, all the theories that have been directed towards trying to explain this phenomena using beta palladium deuteride's characteristics are barking up the wrong tree. It's just simply a waste of time, because we are not working clearly with beta palladium deuteride. It's something else. We don't know what exactly that something else is, but it's a material that has far higher compositions than are able to be supported in the beta phase. 
And it, of course, has other very strange characteristics by itself that are needed to overcome the Coulomb barrier and produce the strange nuclear effects, which everybody admits beta palladium deuterod cannot do. I mean, the skeptics say, well, you just can't do it in that, in that environment. And I say, absolutely true. You cannot. So I'm not selling out to cold fusion. I'm just saying that that's not the material we're working with. Well, recently, I've put together another device, uh, another calorimeter. <clears throat> this one, hopefully, will be of such a nature that skeptics will be hard-pressed to find a, a reason for rejecting it, although uh, <laughs> 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 I need to say more, I guess. Um, anyway, this is a dual calorimeter. Uh, it consists of a, of a jacket through which a uh, constant known flow of water takes, uh, is, goes. Uh, it's um, temperature in and temperature out. It's measured. It's surrounded by a vacuum jacket to isolate it from the environment. Uh, then that's in a box that is, uh, con has in a constant temperature. It has an internal uh, heater that can be used to calibrate it. It has several lugum capillaries to measure the uh, uh, open circuit voltage. It has uh, probes, ther thermistor probes on the cathode, several other places. It's easy to take apart. It's, you can see inside of it. Uh, you can measure the heat two different ways, both by the uh, isoparabolic technique and the flow technique. Anyway, that's the one I'm presently using. <clears throat> this is, gives you a picture of it. The calorimeter, my, uh, my light went out. This you can see is the calorimeter. There's the anode in there. The water flows through here, through the jacket, out here, through a mixing where it, where it more or less equilibrates with itself, through past the thermistor, and then back out. This also allows me to measure the superconductivity of a sample once I get one that's a actually producing cold fusion, because uh, I have the circuits in there, and then eventually I'll put the coils around there. Around, this, around the calorimeter that will enable me to measure the magnetic susceptibility of the material inside, which allows you to detect superconductivity. How am I doing on time? OK. Well, one thing I've said about trying to understand is the nature of the errors in these calorimeters, uh, both mine and other people's. And one of the complaints by skeptics has been that bubbles cause gradients within the, I mean, the, the, there's, there's gradients within a cold fusion cell, and it's these gradients that introduce the errors. And, uh, and so you don't really know what the temperature is inside. Well, I have a cell that, uh, not the one I just showed, but, but another one, where you can measure the applied power, and you can measure the top and bottom temperature of the electrolyte. And I have the ability to apply power by electrolysis or by a joule heater inside. If you apply joule power, maybe I can do it over here, you can see that the gradient increases as you apply more and more power to the internal heater. But if you put just a little bit of electrolysis in, such as to create bubbles, that gradient disappears. On the other hand, if you're using just electrolysis, it, the gradient is essentially zero because of the bubble mixing. And this is what Pons and Fleischmann have advocated, and a number of other people have demonstrated, that the bubble mixing essentially removes all gradients of any significance within the, within the material. And you, or within the electrolyte. And you can see, here's another. Uh, this is the heater current, <coughs> constant heater current, temperature gradient, temperature gradient, constant heater current. Uh, and this is applied electrolytic current. And you can see, as you apply a very small amount of electrolytic current, the, the uh, gradients drop down to essentially zero and remain constant. 